Well, we'll get started. Um, I'm Jill Miranda Baker, for those of you who don't know me. Um, we are here for our last virtual event of the season of our October to June season. It's been a long virtual season. Uh, we can't wait to get back in person come October when we kick off our new season, but it will also include virtual components. Um, we do plan our lecture series to be virtual and in person, to be in person and with a live stream component, and uh, likely we'll do the same with community views. And then what we're planning for this event, key, uh, cocktails with the curator and guest, is to take it on the road at local establishments, um, offering that four times during the season. So our plans are still in the making. That's what we're looking at right now. Um, we're really happy you could join us tonight and for all the programs you've joined us with and uh, enjoy it this evening. And I'll kick it off to Brad who will introduce our wonderful guest. All right, thank you everyone for joining us. We're happy to see so many faces, lots of, lots of familiar faces. And I'm thrilled to have uh, Miss, uh, our Dr. Corey Convertito from the Key West Art and Historical Society joining us today. She's been a, a longtime friend of the Discovery Center and a big help uh, as I have made my way through uh, curating this, this lovely facility and we're thrilled to have her. And um, hello, Corey. Hi. Thanks, so, for, thanks for having me. <laughs> um, thanks for joining us. She's down in Key West. Um, so as, this, as, as many of you know, this, this operates that you have questions, feel free to raise your hand or, or add, just ask out loud. And uh, Corey's specialty is, um, is a, a British naval heritage, maritime history. Um, also, you know, we, we, we can talk tourism, we can talk uh, uh, Henry, uh, Stanley Papio, who, who was an eclectic, uh, eclectic Key, Key Largo artist, actually, who has a, a great deal of his interesting uh, sculptures, metal sculptures down in Key West. Um, and Corey is, she actually has multiple, multiple facilities that she, that she curates, including the Key West, uh, the Custom House and um, the Lighthouse, the Lighthouse Museum, East Bartello Tower. And, and Tennessee Williams Museum. Yeah, so she's she's just just does one or two things and a day. Should be Monroe County Jail. <laughs> so <laughs> we're busy. Yeah. Well, so uh, I guess uh, first of all, I'll say uh, thank you for a having me. This is this is uh, fantastic. Uh, we we do um, something similar called Happy Hour with a Historian down uh, down in Key West, and uh, normally we do it a little earlier in the day. Um, so I'm. Uh, I'm at work, I'll do this and I'm not drinking. So at least this later time frame allowed me to come home and, and grab a glass of wine. So that was that was pleasurable. Uh, and the other um, part of this is and I would like to make an excuse or, or say sorry ahead of time. I'm home, I have a dog and two cats who will probably make an appearance at some point. So just never mind the mammals because uh, they're not used to me being home and having to do this. That is familiar for us, Corey. Yeah, I bet, I bet. Yeah. We've, we've, we've all seen each other's houses and pets by now. <laughs> Just usually I'm at work when I do ours. Uh, so this is this is kind of neat. Um, so until there's some questions, I mean, I'm happy just to kind of chat about what we do and the types of history that we cover uh, down here in Key West. You know, we're, we're Key West Art and Historical. We try to be really inclusive of um, all the all the Florida Keys and trying to tell that history because we're all very much connected in that way. Um, but you know, we, we do focus a lot on uh, you know the lower keys, and especially now with you guys being up in Isla Mirada, it's such a nice addition um, to telling that full uh, Florida Keys story. So it's it's kind of nice that we are able to partner together for for a lot of things, and uh, and you guys are up there to focus on. On the upper keys, a story that we shamefully don't tell it enough down here. So it's 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 a lot of fun to 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 tell different types of stories, you know, about art and literature and um, you know the, the military being here and the Civil War. I mean, there's just so many topics that we get to cover. It's uh, we're it's an embarrassment of riches, I think, uh, down here. People don't sort of realize a small place can be so so rich in its history. And what's really interesting is that we've worked together on kind of joint, joint projects 
um, covering, you know, the same topic from different, you know, from the upper keys and lower keys perspective. But what, and I'm sure Corey would agree, is that once what really becomes apparent as you look into the history of the Florida Keys is that it really is not just a Key West thing and not just an Alamorada thing, but the connections really run up and down the Florida Keys. And, and, and history really is connected up and down. It really is one, one, you know, one island chain. It's not, you know, people talk, talk about, you know, I'm going to Key West, I'm going to Alamorada, but the history really permeates all, all, all of our communities. Yeah, and, and I think that's important. And that was one of the first things that I think you and I worked on together was trying to connect the history of those lighthouses, this string of offshore lighthouses and, and uh, you know, the one in Key West and all the way out to the Dry Tortugas. And, you know, we, I see the Key West lighthouse every single day, but, you know, to think about it in that broader picture of it, it connects all of the keys, it connects our keys with the rest of Florida. Uh, you know, it, it, it helps to work with organizations like yours in order to put those things into context. You know, you get that broad brush approach to something rather than looking at the minutia in the history. So it's always really nice to think about, you know, the keys in total or part of Florida, which is something, you know, we, we try to tell that story. Because we do get a lot of visitors from Florida that are familiar with their region's history, but they don't know a lot about the keys. And so trying to connect those those places and some of the same names you know people up, up on the mainland you know like st augustine no flagler 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 um and all the way down the east coast and they don't realize i think often that flagler we all know flagler down here as well um because he, he does connect everybody but we we share that history and so to tell it in that sort of broader context is is really important and something that that we strive to do i think both of our organizations really strive to do that Absolutely. So does anybody have any questions for either Corey or myself or something we can jointly tackle? Yeah. Or you just come here to watch us drink booze? <laughs> we can do that too. I too. <laughs> I'm happy with that. Corey, I'm happy to throw out a, a oh, cool. kind of start the conversation. Um, I, I've seen some of the presentations and topics that you've you've covered in your um, in the programming for Key West Art and Historical Society um, since I have a membership there and I never get down there to listen to you talk but I, I know tourism is one of the subjects you've covered um, and I think I, I recall there being some sort of story about our tourism really being born out of uh, you know the depression and bankruptcy and you know, government intervention. And so I was wondering if you could kind of talk a little bit more about, about that part of our, our shared history. I think tourism is important up and down the keys. Yeah, oh, sure, absolutely. I can uh, <laughs> bore you to death with that. Um, see, you know, the, the thing is, you know, the keys, what we think about the keys now is not what the keys, you know, were in, in the 19th century, even in the early part of the 20th century. I mean, the keys are really industrious through all, all of that time period, well up into you know, the Great Depression, and we look at it through a tourism lens, and a lot of us base, uh, that, are, that are working in the Keys base, our, um, our, our paycheck comes from a tourist industry, and that wasn't always the case. Uh, for a lot of the time, and especially in our early history, the, the folks that were visiting here were doing so typically for work reasons, um, and those that were not coming for, uh, you know, either for sponging or for wrecking industry or, or pineapples uh, up the Keys, we're, we're here for their health. Like that's where the tourism industry really blossomed early on are people who are coming from northern cities and it's being recommended by their doctors to uh, find a warmer climate for the winter time. Tuberculosis was a big deal uh, and they felt that like suffering um, in, in the winter up in New York and Chicago and Boston and such um, was was really bad for those those pulmonary diseases. And so they suggested that they come, you know, find someplace warm. And, and so they they do come and they're not coming, um, you know, in droves like they do now. So that was really the beginning of uh, tourism um, because there was nothing for them to do, really, except relax and write letters home. And uh I think the, the Great Depression, which took, a, Key West was already feeling 
um, some pretty significant uh, economic downturns before, well before the Great Depression. The cigar industry started moving up to Tampa. There was better transportation networks up there. So Key West is, is in a bad position even in the mid 1920s. And the Great Depression just makes that situation so much worse. Um, as people are losing their jobs. There are a lot of the city's residents are uh, on reef roll, re, sorry, reef rolls, and they're, I mean, I think it's like something, that some estimate between like 70 to 85 percent of the Key West citizens are on these relief rolls, uh, not working. Um, and so, you know, they kind of have a choice what to do. Um, the, they ask the governor to step in. He sends a representative from FARA to, to Key West, and he has this vision um, taking Key West out of this industrious location that it had been with the turtling and the sponging and the cigar rolling and completely shifting gears and not relying, um, you know, on, on hard work uh, with, with the natural resources here, but focusing on the natural resources as an aesthetic. Um, and so he sees this and he uh, is, you know, being quoted in newspapers and people thought he was nuts. Uh, Julia Stone was his name. Uh, and people thought he was crazy. He thought, Let's make Key West the Bermuda of America. And, and he starts wearing Bermuda shorts around town and people are thinking he's, you know, he's nuts because everybody here is wearing long pants, long sleeve shirts, even in the middle of the summer, they, they wear jackets and, and here he is, you know, with short sleeve shirts and, and, and Bermuda shorts and people are mocking him um, as he's trying to promote um, Key West as a, a tourist industry. And, and really, it does take hold. They do this and they, they sink a lot of money into a beautification program that extends beyond Key West. Uh, they, they, the golf course on Stock Island is already here and they, they put money into that in order to regenerate that. Um, the Botanical Garden in Stock Island is built with fairer money. The aquarium downtown is built with, with fairer money and by WPA workers. Uh, and they get these folks back to work by just doing simple beautification, um, you know, painting houses, cleaning up the, all the rubbish that's on the side of the road. Uh, and, and it's, it's, I mean, a pretty, <laughs> It's an industrious plan for industrious people. Like they had been this way. And so when you give them a purpose and give them a job, it was fantastic how much they, I guess, became involved in the process, even though they were doing it as volunteers, they weren't getting paid, but eventually they saw this vision and it starts extending more and more up, up the keys as time goes on. You know, these hotels get built, the, the Casa Marina is here before the Great Depression. And, and so is La Concha right downtown on Duval Street. But otherwise, you know, there's not a lot. Um, and so with these tourists flooding in, they, they, the artists, the, oh my God, the art that these, the WPA comes here and makes this amazing body of work. Uh, watercolors depicting this, the flora and fauna that are indigenous to here that we all take for granted when we're looking out our windows and appreciating how beautiful everything is outside. But, you know, somebody in Wisconsin's not having that same view of their window. And so what they do is take that, this, this natural aesthetic, and they create artwork, and then they reproduce this artwork in postcards and brochures and posters, and they are mass mailing it out all over the country in an attempt to really draw tourists here. And that's, I think, where tourism as we know it, it, that's that launching off point for it. It'd be tourists come and now when there's a need for other facilities, theater of the sea, um, you know, then this, this, and when the car, you know, this is all the same time when people are able to own cars as well. And so they're driving. And so you get those Florida, like those quintessential Florida roadside attractions. It, it just creates such a like a whirlwind down here, it changes the entire landscape, uh, you know, aesthetically, you know, for, for people economically, I mean, it changes so very much for so many people. And, you know, going from, but even if we take a conservative figure and say 70% of, of Key Westers were on these relief rolls uh, at, at, the, at the height of the Great Depression, most of them are back to work within two years and, and, and being profitable and they've retrained, um, you know, as cooks, 
or working in hotels or running sightseeing tours or, you know, all sorts of wonderful industries that we now equate with the Florida Keys, um, but they all retrain everywhere and, and start really bringing those tourists down here. So it's, it yeah, was that, also Julia Stone. That was the longest answer Sorry. I could have given you. <laughs> It was awesome. when you talk about that topic though it's yeah. such a, a and transit you know such a huge transition and so transformative um and it I is hear it you. is i mean and then that's our economy now and, and i think you know when, when tourists come down here i mean that's that's part of our job right is to to make them or hope to hope to make them understand where we were before 200 years ago and how far we've come and how many different industries we've been through, how many different occupants have been here when you've had waves of Bahamians and Cubans and, and um, you know, and they, they've been and left or how things have evolved and, and how we get here, you know, how we get to, you know, hotel after hotel after hotel and bar and bar and bar and restaurant and restaurant and restaurant. It's, um, you know, how we get here, it doesn't just happen organically. I mean, there's, there's, a, uh, there's a purpose in the 1830s to make that happen. And they're certainly successful in that. And it, it continues to grow from there. But it was a, a, a pivotal point in the history of, of the Keys to change it to what we kind of appreciate and understand it to be now. And it was oh. also Julia Stone who had the idea to bring the World War I veterans to the upper keys in order to build right. that, you know, to eliminate those automobile ferries because it was not a, it was not a efficient means of transportation to bring people down. Because part of the problem was people couldn't, it was, it was not convenient to get to Key West. Right. It was convenient to drive down from the mainland to the upper keys because it was a, a singular road. But there was that big 40 mile gap between upper Matic, between lower Matacumbi and, and, and no name key, you know, the, in the overseas highway. And they, and they had talked about, you know, about a bridge projects to eliminate those ferries. But again, Monroe County was bankrupt. Florida was bankrupt. You know, there was no money. And it was Julia Stone who had the idea of bringing these, these World War I veterans who, you know, were, who were out of work and, and looking and needing something to bring them down to the Upper Keys to begin building these, these bridge projects that would eliminate the, um, the automobile ferry. And of yeah. course, we know what happened in 1935 after that. But, uh, but it, so Julia Stone really, he affected Key West, absolutely. But again, it, it's this whole connection of all the Florida Keys, how it's not just one island, but you know, what affects one island really affects the whole chain. And, and, and on that same token, you know, when, when, because they're promoting Key West so hard and heavy in, in that sort of 1934 and 1935 period, and they're distributing all these brochures and they're wanting people to get down here. Um, and most are going to travel. I mean, you know, the railroad is, is, is not the principal means of transportation anymore. People are relying on their cars and, and, and the folks in, in the Keys are relying on cars coming down here. And that prompts a lot of the growth, um, you know, along the road because they, they want people to, start, you know, make a, the drive as part of the the vacation. That's part of your experience. It's not you're trying to get here as quickly as possible. Those roadside attractions are. are this is that sort of that beginning of the heyday for for you know come into Gatorama or you know come come look at all these exotic birds here and there, and you can try this different types of fruit and look at all these different plants, and it, it grows out of that. Once you create these destinations, that journey in between point A to where they're trying to get to point B, um, without that, the, the, that connecting area would not have grown as quickly either. So, you know, it, it is, you're right, it's all connected, and, you know, we, we, they're, they're not isolated incidents. All these little fires that are happening are, are all part of the same um, outbreak. It's not, you know, they're, they're definitely not isolated incidents. Hey, Corey, we have a question from David Stoker. Stoker, Stoker. Um, he would like some information on the botanical gardens. And if you have one or two ghost stories about the La Concha up your sleeve. Um, <laughs> or I'm, I'm the wrong person for that. I, I understand. <laughs> That's a different you know, guest altogether. It should be your first... Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I can I can talk about the botanical garden um, quite a bit. We we work with them as a lot of the nonprofits do in the Florida Keys. We all try to work together because we know you know we've we've got a lot of common interests there. And the botanical garden 
um, was was thought about and started during that that particular period in the depression. You know, they part of the beautification of of the Florida Keys was um, you know to create attractions. They knew they needed to have a to get people here is one thing, but to entertain them or keep them occupied and, and let them leave with glowing reviews is, is you know, another element. And so they, um, they decide um, the, the city of Key West owns the property out there. Um, it's got a natural, it's a, it's a natural hammock. Um, and the city turns it over as part of this beautification process and enhancement. They give them all the acres out on Stock Island, and the there was a, a Key West Garden Club, and uh, the the ladies and some gents of the and it's right next to the golf course out there, so people you know you really were were using it for some recreational purposes. So the city's able to turn over um, this this land, and they they not, redevelop. It's not even close, but you know they they sort of demarcate an area, they use the natural hammock. There's a, a natural freshwater pond that's originally on that property, which is unheard of in the Keys. Um, and so, and they plant a lot. They try to implant a lot of indigenous trees in a concentrated area. Um, they're trying to represent um, some other plants, not just that are native to the Florida Keys, but also the Caribbean. They're trying to show the broad spectrum of, of plants and animals here. And, and so they do a groundbreaking ceremony out there. I think it was 1934, 1935, and it was really spearheaded by the, the garden club. And so they're given this big bit of property um, and it, it eventually, like a lot of things, kind of fell into disarray, uh, was ignored for a while when it wasn't you know, visited frequently. And what they ended up doing a few years ago, uh, quite a, well, quite a few years ago now, is it really take back that property. So if you haven't been to the Botanical Garden, um, it's it's, uh, it's a fantastic space. Um, they, they do, Misha is the executive director out there. He does a fabulous job. They have a great set of docents. There's an enormous amount of, uh, of, of trees out there that are indigenous, not only to South Florida, like I say, but but also to Cuba. So they have that element and, and they try to tell that story. Uh, and they also have uh, some Cuban um, some Cuban chugs out there as well on the property, which is kind of neat to see. And, you know, which I get, think doesn't make sense to a lot of people now, but what they tried to do back in the 1930s at developing that area and trying to show the connection between the United States and Cuba at the time was plant a lot of Cuban trees. And so these, these trees make it across the Florida Strait and are planted uh, at the Botanical Garden in Stock Island. It's now these Cuban chugs are there to show that journey. I think that they're very telling of, of the journey, either the trees coming over or just the natural, um, uh, you know, uh, when, when birds are, 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 are traveling, doing that journey between Cuba and Key West, and they're, you know, dropping um, seeds and things. And so these, these things start growing here that normally don't grow. So um, they have a really nice representation out there, and they do great programming. But that all started through FARA. Um, they wanted people, they, they were so focused in the 1930s on aesthetics of the Keys, because they, they're trying to figure out what they can do without I guess making, you know, char building these grand things. They had no money to do it. So what did what did the keys have naturally? What can they focus on? What can they harness that, that was not used for, um, you know, for other things, for products? And it, and it really was, the, it was the birds and it was the, you know, the native um, species, it was trees. And so that was one of their big things. That's why they make the aquarium as well, even though they actually fabricate a building for the aquarium, the thought process for them is the same. They want to focus on the, the, the organisms that live within our, our, our small, small little biosphere here. So that's a lot of it is, is where that came out of. So it did fall into disrepair. It lost some space. It's grown. Uh, the city's re-gifted them um, some land to extend where they're at. Uh, and they, they do a fantastic, fantastic, they took a little bit of a hit during Irma, like a lot of places, but um, they, their canopy is, is really coming back and it's a, a wonderful asset, I think, to, to the Keys to have that. Um, you know, it's, it's the only frost-free forest, I think is what they tell everybody uh, in the United States, which is, which is neat.
I think. Well, that was great because you asked you in your in your talk there, you brought in the Cuban chugs, which was another question that someone had answered, had asked. So well done oh, with your yeah. uh, magic eight ball there. Yes, I can I feel <laughs> like I'm channeling my Johnny Carson, right? <laughs> what are Cuban chugs? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> No, they do. I mean, and that's, I think that's still part, of, that's part of their mission. And that's something that they are relying heavily on because that journey across for, it's not just the people, but also the species, uh, because, you know, there's so many, um, you know, Cuban, Cuban birds that are, that migrate across and things. So they're trying to tell that story by using the Cuban chugs as, as a visual to, to tell that story. And they, they do it a lot, you know, for the students that go there when they have school groups the students know about the Cuban chugs, but they don't know about the birds and the, you know, the trees exist here and, and not somewhere else. So they're able to sort of use that as a, as a demonstration. And interesting um, is that, you know, you know, the Cubans were rafting over here, but rafting is also how some of the, some of the, the, uh, the fauna arrive here from, from Cuba by rafting right. on, on, on trees and other debris that, that float across across the channel and land on the island that is also called rafting which is kind of a nice nice parallel there between yeah. how, how organisms arrive from from one island to another uh, island or, or one uh, body of land to another massive land i guess body of water massive well, land. and a lot of that is also you know it even predates a, a lot of that you know the, the discontent between the United States and Cuba. I mean, a lot of the Cubans, you know, when, when the Ten Years' War breaks out in Cuba, um, and, and a lot of the Cubans are leaving and looking for other opportunities elsewhere, I mean, they're packing up what they can to move to the United States, whether it's here, whether it's Tampa, New Orleans, New York, wherever they're going. Uh, and, and a lot of them have worked in this sort of cottage industry, cigar rolling, and they're bringing their natural materials in the hopes to be able to plant you know, tobacco here um, to make it so they can work in an industry that they're comfortable in, knowledgeable in, successful in. Um, and they're trying to bring that, um, you know, to the Kiesel. Some of that migration happened on purpose and even much earlier than that um, because they were trying to, I guess, um, replicate what was happening already in Cuba. They're trying to like literally pick up everything and, and move to the United States and replicate it. But, you know, as we know, the, the soil in the Keys is not conducive to uh, large scale planting. So it was not going to work, but they didn't know that. And they had to, they had to give it a try. Well, I think it's natural to go to a new land and want to revisit or, or create what's comfortable for yeah. yourself. Well, and there was just so much going on in Cuba. I mean, people's lives were threatened, their livelihoods were threatened, their families, their their economic situation was so dire. I mean, they were desperate to to get out of that situation, uh, you know, right after the Civil War here. Um, and, you know, they're trying to break away from Spain uh, in Cuba that, I mean, they're, they're picking up everything that they can and moving. And that's a scary thing. You know, it's a very intimidating thing. And, and what they're doing is, is just trying to to recreate the life that they know, but in a safer environment. So they, they're, you know, not wanting, not necessarily wanting to learn something new if they don't have to, if they're able to, to still be a cigar roller, but be safer, yeah. they're gonna do it. Absolutely. Joe Sachs, I believe you unmuted yourself for a few minutes. Are you, uh, did you have a question for us or? Joe, different Joe. Other oh, different Joe, Joe, Joe Darrell. <laughs> I'm good. Okay. That still holds for you, Joe Sachs. Oh, well, there's another question, if I may read it. Yes. Okay. How, when did Key West start to get known as the party town? Got to uh, be the 60s uh, or 70s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 fortunately, unfortunately, I don't know <laughs> which, which you use. Um, a lot How of about the Navy coming to town, maybe? Pardon? When the Navy comes in the, in the 40s and yeah. the... Uh, yeah, that's that's really it. The Navy cannot control themselves <laughs> when they get here. I mean, you're you're depositing, you know, thousands of young men <laughs> in a town where they know no one and they and they and they have nothing to do and they have so, quite a bit of free time, as it turns out. Uh, the Key Westers, uh, the people living here, are opening bars left, right, and center to cater to. 
uh, you know, this, this brand new population and it, it grows exponentially in a very short period of time. And they're all single. It's their 20, you know, 20, 22 year old kids coming down here and they're all together and oh god the testosterone so you know it, it just was inevitable when the navy the the navy base during world war one here which is which takes up a, a, a very minor footprint of, of what it does now if you've been down here into what is now truman annex and geodic here still owns a good portion of the property um that's still navy owned um I think it was something like, I mean, it's crazy to think that during World War One, I, I think the figure was like the Navy owned 30 acres or something of waterfront or a, a property in that general area. And by World War Two, it had grown to like, I think, 2,500 acres. By So, you know, they just start grab land grabbing everything they can. And so, you know, 30 acres doesn't require a huge staff. And especially during peacetime after World War One, no one's here. And, the, you know, they have the submarine base um, they, you know, and the Naval Air Station exists at that point, but they're in Trumbo for the most part. And then they just land grab as soon as they know the war's happening, even though, you know, the United States was taking this isolationist approach, which is not real, but they sounded good on paper, um, you know, the, the Navy starts, you know, the federal government starts grabbing everything that they possibly can in that neighborhood because they knew they were going to, they were going to grow. And so when you have that much acreage and you have, you know, the, the sonar school here and you have, um, you know, a lot of Navy ships were, were a coaling station, there's a dry dock facility here, so ships can be repaired here. So you have, and you have- Flight uh, school. Pardon? Flight school. Yeah, you have the flight school. Yeah, well, yeah, NAS was like its Bill. own little animal. <laughs> um, you know, you have that many. How many people do you need to staff that? And they're getting these recruits. And so forget it. Once once they're here, some, some and I mean, and there's there are people that work for the Navy that were specifically tasked with going to the bars every night to look for these kids and tell them to get, <laughs> you know, get back on base. And, and the, one of the big problems was when the Navy starts expanding, because they need the facilities for the sub pits and they need, um, you know, expansion for the, for the, for the flight and the sonar school and just, just barracks. Um, what they don't do right away is create recreational facilities on that property. That was one of the last things they put in. So there, there's no reason for these 22 year old children to be, uh, you know, on base or stay within the confines of, of Naval Station Key West. There was not a lot there. And they eventually went, oh, we'll put a pool table in. Well, that's really not going to cut it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they're still going out. But that was not part of the initial planning phase in doing that. So these these, these young men were around. And there, I mean, there was just, again, um, this is, we're, we're all, this is, cocktails with the curator so i can say this i think in good company the prostitutes coming down from miami were copious at this time um, because of the naval station and they knew the kids were all out um you know having having a great time and so it, it becomes a real problem actually um that they're trying to shut down bars and the newspapers are doing these undercover reports on on the prostitution problems and how the navy is involved in that to the lesser degree army just because there weren't as many people here um, but they, they certainly, there's, it's a, it's really a big problem and it starts proliferating from about 1941 and it's not apparently stops. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, we have a, uh, a, um, another, uh, Dave Stoker, David Stoker wants to, has, wants to know, are there any good stories about Robert? Um, but I will say one thing. Please do. That, uh, what, what's interesting about Robert the doll, this is Aaron's favorite topic is that Robert shares something, something really important with both Corey and Jill Miranda Baker, our executive director. We're all and, birthday um, buddies. Yeah, they're all, they all have the same birthday. <laughs> and we've been lucky enough twice for Corey to bring Robert up to, our, uh, up to Isla Mirada um, to do an, an in-person, you know, uh, where, where David Sloan, who is another uh, um, great, uh, he runs a, a great tour down in, in Key West about, about Robert the doll and knows probably more about Robert than anybody else in the world. But he came up and, and, and did a, a nice presentation lecture for us. And Corey was kind enough to pack up Robert and drive him up in, up in her car 
And so that uh, just so that Jill, Corey, and Robert could all share their birthday together here at the Keys History and Discovery Center. We we got no cake for the record. I got, we got <laughs> for the record, you did get no cake. <laughs> we got no cake, no goodies. We shared uh, a drink, I think, though. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah, the, the, the <laughs> After the program. <laughs> We do share a birthday. Um, you know, it's interesting. I have to say, you know, from a, a pedantic side, you know, uh, having a doctorate, it's it's hard to, to kind of grapple with having to be the curator for Robert at, at times because it's, you know, I am, I am pretty, I don't know, I, I don't know, even keeled, I think, in my mindset. And I really look toward, you know, facts um, for things. So um, we, but we love Robert. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, as a curator, I mean, I've, I've never had a bad experience with Robert. I mean, knock on wood, I've, I've been really lucky. Robert has been uh, in my car uh, on more than one occasion. Uh, Robert, we rode out Irma <laughs> together, so that was great. Uh, Robert and I have flown to Las Vegas together. Uh, Played some you know, slots, I believe. Part, oh, yeah, I put him at the slot. Oh, that was a whole other... That was <laughs> hysterical. That's all. That's what I'll tell you. So I we we got contacted by some ghost ghost adventures or one of these programs to take Robert to to Las Vegas, and I said they called and I said sure. Um, you know we're we're willing to entertain this idea. Um, you know as long as you promise nothing bad is going to happen. Da, da, da. So uh, they said sure, but you can check them into the you know put them in the baggage claim. And I said I uh uh. I can't, I can't do this. I said, if we lose him, <laughs> we're in really in deep trouble because he's so important to what we do and people love him. And, you know, he's been really good to me and he's been great to our organization. Um, so I said, no, you have to buy him a seat on the plane. And so they, you know, they hemmed and hawed and, and I said, my God, all right, now how do I, they said, sure, we'll do it. Okay, good. So now how do I take him? How do I explain to people on a plane that I'm taking a haunted doll on an airplane and not have people freak out thinking that the, you know, the plane's going to crash or, you know, something mechanical is going to fail. And so I, I recruited my husband's, uh, his exterior golf bag. Uh, and I put Robert in a golf bag and put him on the airplane. And I can't tell you how many people were coming up to me going, you, you must really love your golf clubs on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, I do. I really love my golf clubs. They're very expensive. And so we get out Price to Vegas. Uh, pardon? Price Very priceless. <laughs> Precious cargo. And so we get out to Vegas. And uh, so we, we finished filming for the day. And we were exhausted. And I was there for less than 48 hours to do this. We were there all the way there and back in, in, in no time at all. And it, I, I went down to, we were, I forgot what hotel we were staying at. And I have Robert in, in this golf bag and I walked in and there's a security guard there. And he says, you know, what, what do you have in the bag? I said, sir, you know, I, I, said, I, know this, I, I know you hear some <laughs> crazy things, <laughs> but I have a haunted doll in the bag. Uh, and I said, we've been shooting with, you know, Zach Baggins all day. Have you heard of him? Da, da, da. So they said, sure. Uh, and I said, because well, what do you want to do? Because you can't bring this bag in here. And I said, well, OK, I'll leave the bag here. I said, I just want to put him in front of a slot machine and take his photo. And he says, I got to check with the pit boss. You have to come with me. So we go traipsing over to the pit boss. He thinks I'm nuts, first of all. And, and for Vegas, that says something, I think. Uh, and so finally he goes, okay. I said, I want to take his picture. And I know that you're not supposed to take pictures. I said, you can take a picture. Take my phone. You can take a picture of Robert just sitting in a chair. So they take me to an area that was kind of not open for customers. And I, he said, you can take the picture. So I put Robert down. I put his little hand on the slot machine. And uh, I stood behind him and I was snapping a couple of photos of him at the slot machine. And the pit boss was, I mean, when I say he was right behind me, he was uncomfortably right behind me, making sure that I was doing what I said I was going to do. And so I feel like Robert and I, because we're birthday buddies, we we have a pass. Um, you know, I was I was able to do that without any problems. All our flights were on time. We got there. We got back. We were safe. Now I know other people are really unlucky with him, and I, I feel fortunate because we get letters. I mean, when people say we get, I get the museum, and we we read them all. Um, People send letters and it's, it's, I mean, it's sad sometimes to, to hear what people's experience and how apologetic they are, how horrible, you know, like breakups, cancer, um, 
you know, some a family member dying, like pets getting run over. I mean, it, it really runs the gamut uh, with people and their bad experiences with mattress. So I, I count my count my blessings that uh, I've not had a bad encounter with him. I mean, he was in my hotel room overnight. He had the opportunity to kill me if he wanted to. That's Chucky in there, not the same people. <laughs> yeah, not Chucky. <laughs> Robert, Robert was great, but it's because I, you know, I'm very nice to him and I keep him safe at the museum, I suppose. So um, I'm stuff. lucky, but I, I've been really fortunate. But other people really are. I mean, honestly, the amount of emails, social media posts, and then with the COVID, uh, you know, somehow, some way, uh, some story came up in the Philippines that that COVID was Robert's fault, oh and so it was. It was just went all over uh some some news outlet in the philippines it was crazy because robert went from you know he's got his own facebook page so feel free to like robert on facebook uh and twitter and he went from you know like thirty-five thousand likes to something like over three million within a few days of wow of, of this story going viral in the philippines and it was i mean it was nuts but you know and, we, and we've tried to not with Robert right now, we don't want any bad, you know, juju. correct, no bad juju. Uh, you know, we don't want people blaming Robert for COVID. <laughs> so we've been, he's been keeping a low profile. I mean, the museum was closed for a while too. So that helped, but somehow, some way in the Philippines, he would, he's huge in the Philippines. I can't explain it, but and people are really scared of him that have never met him. I mean, I've had letters signed in blood show up oh my. in my office. No kidding. It's, it's interesting. Every day is a different day. David, I'm sure that wasn't quite the story you were expecting, but that was a pretty amazing story. And he's asking when Robert's birthday is, and I'm I'm thinking October 28th, but I could be... Nope. Close, though. Very, very close. 27th? October 25th. 25th. All right. I knew I was, I knew I was in the ballpark. You remember your boss's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Not hurt at all that you don't remember. <laughs> no. I'm hurt you don't remember her birthday. I don't care about us. <laughs> Yeah, Robert, we're, the, we're all Scorpios, so beware. <laughs> the, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, it's interesting. It's, you know, again, like, I, I never know what's waiting for me every day when I get to work and dealing with this history down here because it's so varied. You know, you do have this paranormal history because you get, you know, and David does such a good job with that. But if you haven't been down here and haven't been on a ghost tour or, or, or read any of David's work, there's a lot of haunted places. There's a lot of, it's a lot of history here, and it, and it, you know, a lot of it is based in fact, um, you know, so you get a history lesson even on a ghost tour. That some people aren't believers in ghosts. It doesn't matter. You you can learn so much about the island through even something like that because we're so passionate about what, you know, what people do down here and are really interested in the Florida Keys. And what and East Bartello Tower where Robert lives. USA Today did a poll about the most haunted places in the in the country, and that made the top ten. If I'm yeah, I think we're number mistaken. six. Number, yeah, so, I mean, Maybe there are. Sad. I might be pushing it, but it's definitely single digits. <laughs> yeah, no, it's um. The, Robert is just if you take David Sloan's uh, ghost uh, Robert Dahl uh, uh, tour, it's about the Robert. Yeah, but there are there's such amazing history at East Martello Tower. And it's, it really is, it is an amazing, it's an amazing time. I mean, I think, and, you know, just the, the fact that, that here in, in the Keys, we have, you know, we're not, we're not huge, right? We can all agree that geographically we're, we're not a, a massive specs, specs area. In the water. We have, you know, four civil war forts within, you know, 80 miles of each other. So I think that says a lot, you know, to what the federal government actually thought about our geographic position and how crucial Key West and the Florida Keys are, um, you know, between the lighthouses and that four Civil War forts in 70 miles. And there was actually meant to be six of them. They just canceled the last two that were meant to be built. So there, there were supposed to be two more Martello Towers uh, down here. It, uh, you know, I, I think, why, why, why? Where else does this exist in this country? I don't know. Well, what's really amazing about, about our little island chain is how many wars historically in, in, in American history can be connected to the Florida Keys? I mean, it's hard to pick a war that is not 
connected in some way to the Florida Keys. I mean, yeah, World War One, World War Two, you know, uh, the Spanish American War, oh, Civil that, War. Sure. There, there's so much. It, this is a great place to come fish and drink and relax, and you know, go on a ghost tour. But the amount of history that these little islands contain or or mm-hmm. con- connect or or, or 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 touch is really incredible. There was. So after the um, Spanish-American War, which was, you know, huge for the Keys because, you know, Cuba and the proximity to, there was a, a big population boom in the Florida Keys, at, like, directly after the Spanish-American War because people didn't realize it existed. And it, that war in particular brought so much attention here and not a lot of other places um, and and feeling that vulnerability that when you realize that a, a potential enemy is 90 miles away from you, you know, it, it, there were there were journalists stationed in uh, Miami, uh, you know, and, and down the Keys. And I mean, the, the uh, for a long time in that time period, there was a, 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 t- a reporter for the New York Times. The New York Times, which is one of the biggest and widely distributed newspapers at the time. Um, they had a reporter stationed here full time, and that was uh, right after the war. And they stayed after the war uh, because Key West was just such a, you know, and the, and the Keys really were such a hive of activity that, uh, you know, the, the New York Times doesn't just deposit reporters in every big city everywhere. I mean, there was a, enough here going on that it warranted, uh, you know, a staff member to be here all the time. And, and a lot of that came out of the war reporting. They wanted to know because this was you know, the central hub for that very short war with, with Cuba, but, or in Spain, I should say, but they, you know, there's, there's a spotlight that shines on this archipelago after that, um, where it didn't for any, for any other big city, especially during that war. And that's, and that's at at that pivotal time where people are, you know that journalism is 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 springing forward and there's a lot more availability of information for people and so to have those journalists focused on that time period here uh was was huge because there was a lot more access to information by that time i mean the civil war you you didn't and people didn't even know what was going on for part of the war in, in rural parts of of the united states because they didn't have access to information but you know fast forward 50 years and they have a lot of access to information through through newspapers and all of these newspapers keep saying Florida Keys, Florida Keys, Miami, 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 Key West. You know, it's it's crazy how how much this population blossomed uh, because of that afterward, because of our involvement in that in that war in particular. I want to um, cut in real quick. Dana Seaback had another uh, oh. question: Do they still have the walking ghost tour? There are several ghost tours in Key West. Um, there is David Sloan's. Uh, ghost sport tour at the at the Martello Towers. There are walking tours. There are uh, ghost ghost gravestones and they do a trolley tour. Yeah, that, that's a trolley tour. But there's right. there there are a number of of paranormal or ghost related tours down in Key West still available. Yeah, and I, and they do um, for for people that are not okay with ghosts I per se, especially at night. Uh, the cemetery down here does walking tours during season as well, so you can go to the Key West Cemetery and learn a lot about the some of the Key West residents. But it's done in daylight, and you probably feel a little safer. And and uh, and again, being it's, there, it's stories, but also great history. You, you learn great history on, on that tour as well. Yeah, yeah, you do, you do. That's some cool. There people. are really so many <laughs> avenues. There are so many avenues of 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 information. That, you know. Of, of, of different different ways to to be taught or, or to learn or to share history and, and these the, these other avenues are you know not for everybody but it it is a way to to you know to share some some of the great history yeah Hayward, yeah. i think you have a question there Haywood? yeah there got me all right you hear me i do you hear me? Where okay are you? I know. First time he, he he attends all of them pretty much. Okay. The first time he's asked a question, so awesome. Oh, he's ready to just <laughs> twist there me to is. the wall. I got it. No, I just wanted to say, you know, I've been to your museum, Brad, and it's really a wonderful spot. But I only get up to Isle Morada a couple of times a year, maybe. So it's never really 
justify getting a full membership. And I was sort of wondering if you two organizations may work out some form of rep, 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 reciprocity. Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, right. I mean, I mean, have you had I mean, cocktails? <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, so, but I mean, you know, full, full re- wouldn't make much financial sense, but you know, maybe a 25 to 50 percent discount just to go see the new rotating exhibit when you've already seen the museum as a whole. Just a suggestion. That's an idea. We do. It's nodding. We're going to talk about this later, but that's a great suggestion as far as Key West Art and Historical is concerned. And I don't, I don't know if Key West Art and Historical Society participates in it, um, but uh, or do you do the time travelers program? We're time, yeah, we're time travelers. Yeah, we're time travelers as well. So that does um, because oh, so anyway, go ahead. You can you the can part of out. that. There is a discount, um, a reciprocal discount on a general admission. That would it's different okay. than membership, but um, you know, for coming up for a day trip or something, if you are a member um, at Key West Art and Historical Society through the time travelers program, you would get a discount on a day admission here. Okay. Yeah, and I'm not sure. That's not my. Thank God, it's not my department. But uh, exactly. you no, know, I know we're part of Time Travelers, and I'm not sure what we do. But I know for you folks up in Isle of Rod, if you come down, we do some sort of reciprocity. But I, what it is? I don't know. Not my monkey. <laughs> not my circus. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> well, good. That great was great, Hayward. Thanks. Yeah. And next time you come up, let me know. I'll, I'll give you a tour. That goes for everybody here. <laughs> <laughs> Just you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Was there any any other question? Oh, anything I can? Anything weird and wonderful you want to know about? Well, you brought up one of the um, you know your your haunted uh, artifact in your collection. But what is your your favorite artifact in your collection? I know you have a, a an extensive, extensive collection there amongst all of your museums. We do, we do. We're really lucky. We've so we've been around since 1949. That's when we were established, um, and they opened the museum. Uh, they opened East Martello first, and that finally they so they got together in 49, and then opened in 1951. So we've been a collecting institution since 1949, which is a, a heck of a long time. Uh, to say I have a favorite thing, I, I can't. I, I mean, that's like choosing your favorite kid. I, it's hard because, you know, it depends what I'm working on. And I, we've got some really cool Civil War artifacts. And then the Mario Sanchez, we have so many Mario Sanchez artifacts that are beautiful. And um, I don't know, you know, it could be, being art and history, we, we are, it, it just makes it that much more <laughs> difficult in some ways because you're not just focused on one thing and you're trying to blend the two together. And some artists like Mario, they do it so succinctly by creating these historical views through their artwork that it makes my job, you know, so easy to put those things out. But, uh, you know, I don't know. We've, we've um, just, we've recently migrated. And for those of you that are not um, on our, our website or whatever this is, we do, we have been working diligently. And I say we, it's, now it's just me because I my assistant uh, quit during COVID, so it's just me now. Uh, we're we've migrated to a new platform where um, a lot of our collections have been digitized and available online. And so we, you know, it's it's not comprehensive by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm I'm legitimately putting you know five to fifty objects online every single day when I'm at work. Um, so you know it, it keeps growing and growing. But what I've done is created a little. A part of our website that I, I call collection highlights. If you go to our website, you go to collections, you can see what I call our collection highlights. And it's just a few pieces that we've, I've, I've picked out that I think are emblematic of what we do, uh, are important to our mission statement, um, but they're by no means comprehensive. I didn't want to inundate it because if I start throwing my favorites in there, it'll, it'll be 500 items deep. Um, so we've tried to pick a few. So, um, you know, there's Mario Sanchez in there. Um, we just got these glass plate negatives that we bought um, that that are show, that show the railroad workers at Pigeon Key um, that were done by a photographer, but they're, they're beautiful. I mean, they are probably one of the most gorgeous things I've ever, we have, I've ever seen. Uh, um, 
that that has been that has become available to us, and we were able to to get those. Um, so you know, but so it runs the gamut. I I don't know to pick a favorite. I don't know, but you know, we've got postcards and photographs, and we we were, um, as I have a registrar that comes in one day a week just to help us inventory and make sure things are where they where we think they are, mm -hmm. um, and we have the Key West Lighthouse Museum that's one of ours in our portfolio. Uh, what, it was operated, so when it shut down as a light station in 1969, the Coast Guard ran it as a, as a navigational beacon until then. Um, they, uh, the Coast Guard turned it over because it was no longer registered on a navigational map. So the light is still on every night, but it's not used for uh, navigation purposes. So the Navy got a hold of the property and they set up a, um, they set up a, uh, what they called a military museum. And it was a lot of the equipment that they had from World War II that was surplus that they just had at Naval Station Key West and they put it on the property. Now that included a Japanese submarine, that included a uh, Blue Angels jet, uh, it included, I, God, I so much stuff, <laughs> you know, from, stuff from the USS Maine that was actually germane to Key West. A lot of it wasn't associated with us. And when they decided in, in the 80s that they no longer wanted to uh, be the stewards of that property and they turned it over to us, they gave us everything that they did not want, which was, <laughs> a lot um and it, it's not necessarily keys related we have we have more guns and swords in our collection than i oh my god so my registrar calls us he tells everybody that we are the best armed art museum in the entire world because we have so much weaponry. but again it's it's not it's not from the keys it's you know it was on display as part of this military museum that was at the lighthouse for a long time so we have some weird and wonderful things that we shouldn't have um, that are not necessarily applicable, but, you know, they're, they were here at Naval Station Key West, and so we keep them. Um, but, you know, we, we have we have a lot. We have a lot of stuff and, and great stuff. And not so Corey, great. is the, um, the glass plate negative, uh, that, is that exhibit on, still on right now, or is it? Yes, yes, and we are going to extend it because it has been so wildly popular. Uh, I'm not trying to toot my own horn here these they were a find and a half i have to say they are there are pictures if you haven't been down here make an excuse to come down to key west for the day if you're if you're in florida um so we took these glass plate negatives we digitized them um and print printed them out as archival prints so you can actually see the detail work i don't know who this photographer is his name is a um all we know is it's a v Raveno. so he's a german uh and a, a nice uh one of our um great supporters is trying to help us with genealogical work to try to figure out who who this man might be um I, I don't know if he was hired by the company but he comes down and he takes pictures of the workers you know he does he's not interested in the railroad the the, the rivets he's not interested in the steel he's not interested in the barges he's interested in the people and it was so cool to get this collection uh, we ended up with 60 some odd glass plate negatives, but it's, there's a picture of the bit and there, everything is staged. So he's a portrait photographer. Um, and it's these, oh my God, these guys are sitting out in front of, of the, the, the kitchen, the cookhouse on Pigeon Key, and they're holding a platter, which I don't know what kind of baked good is sitting on this platter. And the detail, and there's a dog sitting on the baker's lap, and there's these other guys with the aprons on, and the quality is so good, I can zoom in, and you can see all the, the plaque in their teeth. I mean, that the quality is, is so incredible. You can read the food labels on these cans. I, I, I'm, I'm blown away, I, and we have no idea who this man is, but those were... A reason, and, and it, it is, it's focused on, I could see the freckles on people's arms and the dirt in their fingernails. That's how good this quality is on these images that were taken. So I'm, I'm sure that's probably because they've been sitting on my desk, but that's what comes to mind. But but to me, like, for I was talking to somebody yesterday about them. Um, the, the WLRN is going to do a little blurb on them and, and show some images. Um, what, what amazes me and the reason that I'm so attracted to them is everybody, when you talk, especially with the railroad, the thing everybody thinks about is the railroad. And you think about Flagler, how much money he spent, you know, how, how much 
earth did he have to move to put all this track down? And where did the concrete come from? And where did you get the steel from? And, and no one seems to really think about the workers. You know, I mean, you do, but kind of as a, as a full group, like, oh, we, you know, labor, labor shortages, labor shortages, and they're recruiting from here and here. But then you put these faces um, to, to those workers and it's, it, it just changes your entire perspective to have that human interest element. And I think that's, that's, that's my job as, as that curator for the Key West Art and Historical is to really put that human interest level out there. You can talk about how much money people made and, and who was successful at this, but until you start really drilling down into who really who deserves a lot of the credit for what got accomplished, um, you know, you, you need to look at people. And that's what, and that's what folks at the museum relate to. They don't care about the names and the dates and the things, you know, they, they want to see a person and relate on that basic human level. And Dana and I have the same question. We both would like to know how long are they on display? So they were supposed to be on display until early September, but um, we've, we've uh, pushing a show back into, um, there's a show coming in October. So we're gonna have them up probably until the first couple of days in October that they'll be on display, but they've all been digitized and they're on our website. So you, if you can't get down to Key West, if you go to our website and go to collections and put in, you can go to exhibits and figure out the spelling of his name because it's a, a German spelling um, and it, you can put it in and, uh, and find all these images. They're so cool. They're really cool. I, I don't know how we lucked into these and, and, and they've never been published anywhere. We've never seen these images before. So we were able to acquire them during COVID. It's been, it's been a, a great pleasure to work with these in such a, you know, uncertain time to get these and get to know these guys. They had it way worse than we do right now. So it's been, it, it's been a good barometer, I think, to work with those images and realize those people had it way worse. So whatever we're going through right now, we're okay. I mean, they're blood, sweat, and tears, you know, working on Pigeon Key to make that happen um, is, is much more intense than anything else that we've, uh, that we've got going on. So it's, it's been, it's been fun. Excellent. So come down and see them. They're really worth it. Well, on that note, it is seven o'clock. And if there's any last minute questions, we could we could uh, tackle those. If not, we could uh, about time to, to wrap up this this session of Cocktails with the Curator with our fabulous guest, Corey Convertito, Dr. Corey Convertito. And her dog Molly, who's probably under a foot right now. Right, sitting like uh, <laughs> legit laying on my right foot. <laughs> well, it's also thundering here, so I don't know who else is in Key West that might be on here, but there's some thunder. So I don't know if it's you, if it's the thunder, but she's here. Right. Thank you so much, Corey. It was great. Thanks, Brad. And um, thanks everyone for being with us tonight and with us uh, as an organization. Thank we'll you, everybody. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was great, Corey. Thanks. That was fun. We'll do it again sometime. <laughs>